Um, we're really pleased to see everybody um, uh, here this evening um, for the third annual uh, Dr. Paul B. Winkler College of Humanities and Social Sciences annual lecture. Um, I'm Stephen Haig, uh, the director of the Rowan Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and it really is a great pleasure to have you all here for uh, tonight's program. As many of you will know, this lecture was postponed from, uh, because of something, sort of a freak snowstorm, you may remember, that we had last November. Um, but Professor Octum has very graciously agreed to return um, uh, to Rowan University, and I'm certain that his uh, talk this evening will be um, well worth the wait. Um, the lecture um, uh, is named after Dr. Paul Winkler, the longtime executive director of the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education. Um, Dr. Winkler was a, a moving force in establishing the Rowan Center, he was a powerful advocate for decades in the cause of Holocaust and genocide studies and education. I know that he'd be hugely enthusiastic about tonight's topic, which is both extraordinarily important, um, but also incredibly timely. We're grateful to have the support of the New Jersey Commission for this evening's lecture, thanks to Larry Glazer, the current executive director. I'd like to say just a few words of thanks before we get started to those who have made this event possible. Tonight's lecture is sponsored by, the Rowan, by uh, Rowan's College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, the dean, Nawal Amar, and the entire dean's office have been enormously supportive, um, as always. I'm particularly grateful to my colleagues who have helped to pull this together, um, especially Dr. Jennifer Rich, uh, my longtime co-coordinator um, of the center, um, Professor Jody Russell Manning, who was instrumental in bringing Professor Ockham to the Rowan campus, Drs. Mikkel Dack and Karen Uslin, um, who also helped with the organization, and Denise Williams, the administrator for the history department. The lecture is also part of the series marking the end of the First World War, Hidden Histories of World War I, and we're grateful to the History Department uh, and its chair, Bill Kerrigan, for organizing these programs. Clearly, this evening's lecture illustrates that the legacies of the First World War very much resonate today. The Rowan Center is um, aided enormously by um, the Rowan Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies Student Association. Um, they work closely with the center, and I'd like to recognize a, a couple of, uh, uh, of those who are involved with the Student Association. Um, President Maximilian Santiago, Maximilian, if you'd stand up, if you don't mind, um, as well as Vice President Julia Gibbons, who is in the back. Julia, you want to, to give a wave? Um, I'd also like to draw your attention, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, um, to the latest issue of Rowan Magazine. There are several, a number of these kind of spread around the... Um, uh, uh, around the room. Um, this is hot off the press. We literally just received these um, uh, within the last day or so, and the cover story focuses on the center. Um, and, co uh, and the cover feature actually highlights another one of our history and education majors and our RCHS intern, Natalie Morris. Nat, are you, uh, where are you, Nat? Oh, stand up back there. All right, so here's Natalie, you are now famous as the uh, face of uh, the Rowan Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Um, I do hope you'll pick up a copy and read about our activities. If you haven't visited Rowan before, um, please do take a moment to talk with one of our brilliant students. Um, they're really central to our success, and I, I think you'll really be impressed. Um, the program for this evening is that the lecture will be followed by uh, some time for formal questions. Afterward, uh, you're invited to the back of the, the ballroom for a light reception, and Professor, Professor Ockham will be signing copies of his books, which will also be for sale. Um, we hope that you'll stay and that the conversations that start with the lecture will continue informally afterward. Finally, the center has a busy program of activities and um, uh, calendars are available um, as well as we'd uh, very much appreciate it if you left your name and email um, so that we can stay in touch with you and, and keep you apprised of our activities. Again, thank you all very much for coming out this evening. Um, I'd now like to introduce my, uh, my close colleague, Professor Jody Russell Manning, to uh, introduce tonight's speaker. Okay, uh, 
Thank you uh, again, Stephen. Uh, my name is Jody Russell Manning. I'm the program director here for the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Um, historian Tanner Akcham uh, holds the Kaluzian Mugar uh, Chair uh, for Armenian Studies, Genocide Studies at Clark University. Akcham grew up in Turkey, where he was imprisoned for editing a political publication and was subsequently uh, ad adopted as a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International in 1976. One of my favorite quotes from his activism days was that he viewed being arrested and imprisoned almost akin to taking a holiday. Um, Akcham later received political asylum in Germany, and in 1988, Akcham started working as a research scientist in sociology at the Hamburg Institute of Social Research. In 1996, he received his doctorate from the University of Hanover with a dissertation on the Turkish National Movement and the Armenian Genocide against the background of military tribunals in Istanbul between 1919 and 1922. He is widely recognized as one of the first Turkish scholars to write extensively on the Ottoman Turkish genocide of the Armenians in the early 20th century. He is the author of more than 10 scholarly works, as well as numerous articles in Turkish, German, and English on the Armenian genocide and Turkish nationalism. His most known works are, um, his most known book is A Shameful Act, The Armenian Genocide and the Question of Turkish Responsibility, which received the 2007 Minnesota Book Award for general nonfiction. A side note, most of my Rowan Historical Methods students, who are a lot of you are here tonight, um, have brought their copies for you to sign. So you have a small fan base here, Tanner, I have to tell you. Um, another important work, of course, is his work, The Young Turks' Crimes Against Humanity, The Armenian Genocide and Ethnic Cleansing in the Ottoman Empire, um, which was awarded the 2013 Hurrian Book Prize of the Middle East Studies Association and selected as one of the foreign affairs best books on the Middle East for 2012. Akcham's latest book, The Killing Orders, Talat Pasha's Telegrams in the Armenian Genocide, which will be available for purchase and signed uh, following this lecture, is his newest work. With this extremely impressive bio, I must tell you another side about Dr. Akcham. Uh, we met at Clark University many, many moons ago. When I was a graduate student, I was assigned to give him a campus tour. He uh, had previously visited Clark, and so he quickly turned to me and said, can we please just skip that and go have coffee? I will never forget that, because that discussion really elucidated not only his focus on this remarkable scholarship, um, he is known as the Sherlock Holmes of the Armenian Genocide, but more important, right, our coffee and discussion showed that he is a kind, generous, and very witty man. And moreover, it showed how much he cares about his students. He has been an amazing role model to me, and one that I try to emulate for my students. Uh, so I'm extremely honored to have him here at Rowan, and so please join me in welcoming Dr. Tanner Akcham, my dear friend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this lovely introduction. And uh, I'm really very happy to be here. There was no snowstorm today again. <laughs> we are all lucky, lucky, but we had some technical problems. Uh, thank you very much, really, for inviting me for this evening. Uh, my talk today is about my book on killings order uh, of Talat Pasha. And basically, it is on Turkish denialism. And uh, with confidence, we can say that the Armenian genocide is an established fact and has taken its rightfully important place within the field of genocide studies. Despite this fact, one of the most unique features of Armenian genocide is still long-standing denial by successive Turkish governments. The main Turkish denialist argument was and has been that there was no central decision taken by Ottoman authorities to exterminate Armenians. Everything was a legal operation of resettlement. So this is a very important point. So the main characteristic of Turkish denialism is that it has been an inherent component of the genocide since the beginning of the events themselves. 
So in other words, the denial of Armenian genocide began not in the wake of the event, but it was intrinsic part of the plan itself. The deportation and killing of Armenians were performed under the guise of a decision to resettle them. The entire process, in fact, organized and carried out in an effort to present this image. I will show you a couple of documents also. They produced documents towards that direction. Everything legally and in the documentary ways covered that it was a normal resettlement process of entire population. We have enough evidence for these. The archives are full. So this means we have to rethink denialism again. Usually, we all think that there is a difference between facts, opinions, and interpretations. These are different things we consider, and we separate them from one another. We would like to believe that the truth, there is one truth, and rests upon established facts over which there is a consensus. As such, they are not the same thing as opinion or interpretation. We would also like to believe that the practice of denialism in regard to mass atrocities is a simple denial of the facts, but this is not true. Denialism has its own truths and has own facts. There is a nebulous territory between truth and denialism. This is the important part. So the theoretical background to explain this, I have to use a model that Michael Roth Trullo, I might pronounce the name wrong, a Chicago anthropologist, he developed a model, he wrote a book, it is the, the title is The Silencing the Past, very important book, and in his book, in introduction, he developed actually four main steps how we silence the history, how we deny the history, you can understand this way also. The first moment is the fact creation, the making of sources. You make your own sources. And second important moment is the fact assembly, the making of archive. So you put these facts together and you create your own archive. And the third is the telling the story. So you make the narrative based on the facts and your archive. And the fourth is the moment of response retrospective significance, the making of history in the final instance. So this is how you create the national history, national storytelling that everybody agrees. There is one way of American history, Turkish history, and the other histories. And I added a fifth moment to all these, the moment of destroying and proving the falsity of critical documents. This is what Turkish government also did. So number five had two different moments. Moment of destroying the documents, I'll give you a couple of examples, and proving the falsity of critical document. I will show you some example for each of these steps and so that you can understand how Turkish denialism works. And Turkish denialism is not simply denying the facts. Deny they have their own facts and archive. From the beginning, from the April 24, 1915. What is the April 24, 1915? It is the official beginning of Armenian genocide because on that very day, uh, Ottoman authorities arrested around 200 intellectuals from Istanbul. This is how then they launched the genocidal process. So in order to develop their narrative, they had three major operations, Turkish, Ottoman Turkish governments. 
The first one, they create and assemble their own facts and archives. I'll give you a couple examples. Second, hiding or destroying the main bulk of documentary evidence that clearly showed the genocidal intent of Ottoman authorities. What are these? These were mainly for important category of documents. Number one is the teşkilat Mahsusa. This is a special organization. If you know Holocaust, you can compare this with SS, the Nazis, special units established by Ottoman government to exterminate the Armenians. So today in Ottoman archive, we don't have any document related to these paramilitary organization. They are gone. We don't know where these materials are. Second is the uh, CUP, the party that organized the genocide, Committee of Union and Progress. And this party's central committee files are gone. We don't know where these files are. They might destroy all of them when the war ended, 1918. Third important uh, files, some files from interior ministry. We know that because of the point four, military tribunals in Istanbul. There were military tribunals in Istanbul between 1919, 1921. Because a new government came to power, Ottomans lost the war, 1918, and the new government, in order to get better peace conditions in Paris negotiations, they had to try the Union and Progress Party members. And during the trials, we learned, we have some newspaper coverages related to that tribunals, that some files of interior ministry were taken away and destroyed. We don't know where these files are. And most importantly, this is the topic of my book also, these files of the military tribunals in Istanbul are also gone. We don't know where these court cases, where these files are. During 1919, 1921, those who read the Shameful Act, they would know, there were altogether 63 uh, trials. There were around 200 defendants. And against 15 of them, that penalty were hanged. Three were hanged. And the, all others were in absentia. And during the trials, during the tribunals, there were so many important documents came to light killing orders, testimonies, and affidavit of the high-ranking Ottoman bureaucrats, and interrogation of the individuals who organized the crimes. Where are these files? Nobody knows. They are all gone until I discovered some of them in 2015. This is the topic of the book. So all these files, they destroyed, or they are they hide them somewhere in Ankara, in either military archive or in the Ottoman archives basement. We don't know. We have no idea where these four categories of documents are, except the last one, because I will give you some example that I discovered some of them. Or, of course, they couldn't destroy everything. Some documents came to light after the war. A I will talk about it also. A person with the name Naim Efendi, this is the title of uh, my Turkish book, an Ottoman bureaucrat who sold some documents to an Armenian guy with the name Aram Andonion. This is the reason we call it Ar Naim Andonion documents. These were mainly killing order coming from Istanbul to Aleppo. And Aram Andonion published these documents 1921, and Turkish authorities said, Phew, fake documents produced by Armenians, fake truth, like Trump every day. <laughs> he does 20, 30 times every day. So this is the same logic. So Naim Andonion documents, these are the killings order. I will show you, this is the title of the book. Fake produced by Armenians. So now I have to give you each for each these moments, couple examples. This is a telegrams from Ottoman archive from 1915. As I mentioned, 1915, April 24, Ottoman government arrested around 200 intellectuals from 
uh, Istanbul and they were sent to today's central capital of Turkey, Ankara, to prison very close to Ankara. And these 200 intellectuals were taken in three or four groups out of these prison and they were exterminated on their way. This is what we believe. Here a document for you. A group of un uh, Armenian intellectuals, Malumyan Agoni, Daniel Varujian, history teacher Hayak and Adam Yarjanian, and so on. These are the names, and they were taken out of prison. We believe that they were killed. This is what we believe. We don't have any document in our hand, because we cannot hear from these individuals after they were taken out of prison. But according to these Ottoman documents, from the same year, they were taken to, out of the prison, and they were on their way to another city for the trial, and they escaped to Russia. This is an official document that shows these individuals escaped Ottoman authorities, and they were somewhere in Russia. This is another important case. It's a wonderful case. Krikor Zohrab is a very well-known, or was a very well-known Armenian intellectual. He was a lawyer, a man of pen, and a deputy in Ottoman parliament. He was really the man, intellectual, and very close friend of Talat Pasha, the interior minister who organized the entire killing operation. Krikor Zohrab was not arrested on April 24 because he was a friend of Talat, and he was arrested beginning of July, and then sent to, from Istanbul all the way to the southwest of Turkey for an alleged trial. And on his way, he was killed. This is what we believe. But this is a doctor uh, attest, doctor report, and it says that doctor already treated him in a city and consider so that he has a certain heart problem. And later the doctor got the news that he, was, he passed away because of a heart attack. And doctor went to the place and he saw the body and he wrote this report. You will think that Ottoman authorities pressured this doctor to write this report. So simple it is not. Here another testimony and this is from the city, Urfa, the Armenian church priest, Father, Father Hayrebet. Father Hayrebet was taken also to that place. And he says in his signed testimony that he saw the body and he was, it's a very normal individual, passed away because of a heart attack, he was told, and he buried the individual according to the appropriate religious customs. You know, I didn't, uh, really, and actually, they crashed his head, Zohrab's. We know later from other sources. But this guy gave this testimony. So this is the second document for you. And it's not enough. This is another original document. It's hard to see with Arabic letters. And uh, this is a let telegram sent by interior minister to Aleppo and about an inquiry of the death of Zohrab. And in that telegram, interior minister says that he passed away as a result of an accident. And it's not also enough. On September 20, uh, uh, on uh, the same day, also Ottoman government, July 21st, 1915, made an official statement that Zohrab, because he was a well-known individual in the Ottoman Empire, passed away as a result of a heart attack. And it was announced in daily newspapers, and his wife was also informed about the death, that it was a result of a heart attack. So, you are a student here in Holocaust and Genocide Center studies, and uh, jury gives you the uh, work about the uh, Krikor Zohrab's death. Uh, some Armenians, or crazy Taner Akcan, would say he was killed on the way of the Arbakir, but Judy says that, no, no, don't believe it, go to the archive. You have set of documents clearly shows, and it's not 
produced later. These are all documents from exact the same day, 1916, uh, uh, 1915 uh, July, and he was passed away because of an heart attack. Ottoman government never used later these documents because of some other stories. I tell you the story because the killer, he was a very talkative guy and he became a problem for Ottoman government and he was arrested and hanged because the, the issue was not so simple. So because of that reason, they never used these materials. This is one pact of issue. So denialism has its own fact, its own archival material. So I'll give you some other example on the moment of hiding or destroying the documents and the proving the falsity of critical documents. The major Turkish argument, which is a very strong argument until recently, which was a strong argument, show us the original. There was indeed not much documents that showed clearly genocidal intent of Ottoman authorities. That, of course, there were some. Killings, of course it happened, but this was outside government's control. And whenever you argued, we argued that Ottoman government intentionally exterminate Armenians, then the question was, show us the document, show us the original, and uh, or fake documents by Armenians. I'll give you uh, an example, let me jump this. Here, how it works, this show us original argument. As you see on your uh, right side, this is a page from official Gazette, 1919. When the trial were happening in Istanbul, during same time, Ottoman government publishing indictments and verdicts in the Ottoman Gazette. So this is how I could write shameful act. We used extensively these official gazettes and indictments and verdicts published in these official documents. And here, two examples for you. I underlined in that indictment. The public prosecutor was quoting from some original documents in that indictment. One of them saying that uh, Bahati Shakir, it's an important name, uh, like Himmler, he was the person coordinating the entire killing operation. And this guy, the, uh, he was the head of Teşkilat-ı Mahsusa, special organization, and he sent a telegram, this is the quoted in that uh, indictment, are the Armenians being dispatched from there, being liquidated? Are these troublesome people you say you have expelled and dispersed, being exterminated or just deported? Answer explicitly. And when we said or wrote that this is a quote from the main indictment, the answer was, show us the original. How should we know public prosecutor quoted from an original document? He might produce this for himself. And the second important document for the third army commander, belonged to Turk Ar army commander Mahmoud Kamil Pasha. He was controlling the entire today's eastern Turkey or historic Armenia where the majority of Armenians living and most the Armenians from these historic areas were deported. And this is following happened. A lot of Muslim families started hiding Armenians. And the entire deportation and killing operation was jeopardized. And Third Army then gave an order saying that those who have been hiding and maintaining Armenians in opposition to the government orders be hanged in front of their properties and their properties burned to the ground. This is a very clear sign that the government's intention was to exterminate the Armenians. And denialist or Turkish government asked, show us the original. Because they kept all these material secret somewhere, and we couldn't really show the original until 2015. 
I discovered these originals in one of the archives, private archives in New York, belonged to an Armenian Catholic priest, Krikor Gergerian. I can talk maybe in question and answer period more about him, but he kept some records and I tell you how he uh, reached these documents. So what was the question? Show us the original. Here is the original. This is the Bahattin Shakir's telegram that I was talking about. Whether Armenians being dispatched there, being liquidated, or being exterminated, or just deported. There is one important, two important aspects in that document. This is the letterhead, Ottoman Interior Ministry. So they cannot deny the originality of this document. But there is a second important part, why New York Times called me the Sherlock Holmes of Armenian Genocide. As you see here, you see some numbers here. These are Arabic numbers, OK? And on top of each Arabic number, you see that it is decoded, Arabic letters. And this is how the officials decodes the telegrams. They have a coding book, and when somebody received a telegram with these four-digit numbers, then he opens the book and looks their four-digit and decodes here. And on top of it, they rewrote the entire text. And this is the text that we have. And here is some of the words that we have in that document. The word send off, deport, sevk, 4889. The word sir, 2469. So some suffix also. For example, my brother, it comes at the end of Turkish language, 7749. Or plural ending, 9338. And I compared these numbers with Ottoman archival materials. You have to keep something in mind. Ottoman government changed every year this coding system. For example, for one year, if it's for the port 4889, the other year is 5189, something different. Every year, they change the system. And so you have to look the same period. It was this telegram was from July 1915, and I checked through all Ottoman mat available materials in the archive. This is an Ottoman document, harmless document, exists today in Ottoman archive. It says nothing, but it used the same coding system. And this is Shakir's telegram, Ermeni. This is Armenian, 8519. And this is Armenian 8519. So they can not deny the authenticity of these documents also, because it is directly from Ottoman archive and exactly the same coding system. I'm jumping all others. You can read the, uh, in the book more. I went through and checked all documents and discovered that these coding system was exactly the same coding system that Ottoman government was using. We saw one problem. So we have a direct killing order, belong to head of special organization with the interior ministry's coding system, which are available today in Ottoman archive in Istanbul. Second, they were asking the original of the uh, Mahmoud Shevket uh, Kamil Pasha's uh, third army commander, I'm sorry, I have to change the name again. Uh, and in Telegram it says it's considered necessary that those who have been hiding and maintaining Armenians in opposition to government order be hung in front of their parties. And here it is the official uh, letterhead of Ottoman government and this is the uh, Siegel of the Interior Ministry says that this telegram confirms the originality, and we have the original document. We solved one problem. We can solve them some original documents. So what about the false produced materials by Armenians? I told you the story. The story is Aram Andonion. This is the 
individual that I'm talking about. He was arrested April 24, 1915, and he was taken into this prison, and he was taken out of the prison, and on the way he fell from the car and coincidentally broke his leg, and they brought him to hospital. He escaped, he survived. 1918, November, he met, actually he met earlier, but he met a guy, uh, Naim Efendi, an Ottoman bureaucrat, and he bought 52 original documents from these Ottoman bureaucrats, and he was working in the deportation office. This is the reason why he could have access to these materials. And in 1921, uh, great crime, the book was published in Armenian, French, and English languages. And in 1983, Turkish Historical Society published and claimed that the memoir and records that Andonian had published were all fake. It was produced by Armenians. What are these telegrams? These are direct killing orders from interior minister. Seven of them published in that book. Here, this is the document that Andonian published in his book, page 217, as you see, this is three-digit Arabic numbers, and each three-digit is equal for a word, Arabic word, and then the telegram says, Committee of Union and Progress, the party decided to completely annihilate all Armenians living in Turkey. And it continues, without paying attention to women, child and incompetent, no matter how tragic the methods of annihilation might be, without listening to feelings of conscience, their existence must be ended. Original telegram published by Andonian 1921, taken from an Ottoman officials. And this is produced by Armenians. The argument was, I will give you talk about. Or another document, destroy the children of the known individuals gathered by military bases and nourished by command of the Minister of War and inform us. So these kind of documents, there were altogether 52 telegrams published in that memoir or in that book, 1921. And these are the documents that he published, two characters. One is two digit numbers, as you see, one is the lined paper, and the other is three digit numbers. There is a difference between two, as you see, this is an official telegram, because this is a telegram received. And this was a telegram prepared to be sent. This is the reason that there is no decoding on top of these two digit numbers. Only on the receiver end, they, when they receive the telegram, they decode and develop this into a normal telegram. This is coming from anywhere, and this becomes the order, and so on. This three digit that I showed you also has a written form in Arabic, so decoded form. This is, there were no emails at that time. This is how they worked, of course. Three, four step. 1983, Turkish Historical Society published a book, and they made three important claims. Ottoman bureaucrats by the name Naim Efendi never existed, they said. We went through the entire Ottoman archive, interior ministry's personal files. We couldn't find any man with the name Naim Efendi. Second, you can't have a memoir for someone who didn't exist. And third, all these telegrams that you show here, these two digit, three digit, these are all fake because Ottoman government never used two digit and three digit coding system. Very complicated. They argued Ottoman government used only four digit and five digit telegrams. In 1980s, archives were closed, nobody had access to the materials, and nobody could really dispute the strength of these arguments. And these telegrams are claimed the forgeries actually on 12 grounds. The signatures were false, the date were wrong, and as I said, two digit, three digit were never used. Ottoman government used four and five digit numbers. So this is my Sherlock Holmes job. 
I discovered that there is a person with the name of Naim Efendi. I will show you the example. And the second, I found the memoir. Here is the interesting story for you. I'm not a religious guy, OK? I, have, I mean, I'm a humanist, and I don't believe too much in religion. But when I entered in the archive of this private individual, Gergerian, it was really a, in the basement, dark, and shelves full of files without anything, no catalog, nothing on it. And I coincidentally took one of these files, opened, and I saw a file a, for paper, white paper, folded in two, on one side Turkish, in modern Turkish, and on the other side, translation of this Turkish text into English. And on top of it, it says, Naim Efendi's memoir, page 29. I said, oh my god, this guy has the memoir. Why it's so important? Because Aramandonion, the Armenian individual, intellectual, after publishing this memoir, he took all these materials memoir and telegrams with himself to Paris. He became director of Bogos Nubar Library in Paris. If you go today, and he put all this material there, memoir and the telegrams, where are they today? They are not there. They are gone. Nobody knows what happened with the memoir. Nobody knows what happened with telegrams. And this is the reason Turkish government 1983 said, Show us the memoir. There is no Naim Bey. There is no memoir. We couldn't show until 2015, until my book. And we really were silenced because of all other arguments also. And then I also showed actually the events that Naim Efendi was talking in memoir was also accurate. Here is the story. Naim, as the officer in the deportation office, when he was copying, handwritten these original documents, he was writing something in between. Oh, I remember when this telegram came, this and that happened. And I took, I made a list of these uh, telling what he was writing there. And I worked in the Ottoman archive, and I showed that which corroborates these events and individuals mentioned in the memoir with the materials in the Ottoman archive. And also the argument that the claim Pasha's telegram were fake, it's not accurate. They were original telegrams. And I will show you some example. About Naim, the honor is not mine to discover the existence of Naim Efendi. The honor goes to Turkish military archive. In 2005 and 7, they published several volumes, eight volumes on, they call it, uh, Armenian activities in the archival documents, 1914-18. They published eight volumes, each one in four languages. Original Ottoman language, transliteration in Latin, Translation in Turkish, because it's two different languages, actually, and translation in English. And nobody reads 800 pages, and they thought nobody would read. Even they, I think, they, haven't, they didn't read before they published this material. <laughs> because these materials, the volume 7, related to an event here. This is a concentration camp, Metzkene. Meskene was a concentration camp, and 1916 summer, beginning of January, Ottoman government started organizing second phase of killing operation. They first used the entire Syria as a garbage can. They poured the Armenians to that area. And the Armenians arrived the area where the number were more than they expected. Approximately 800,000 Armenians arrived Syria. And they were settled first here around Aleppo in different concentration camps 
and also Meskene. 1916, with the January, they started emptying the entire area. It's not on my map, but you have heard because of the civil war in Syria, Derzor area. This is the uh, desert, and Armenians were deported from here and exterminated there. 1916 spring months, but those deportees arrived in this concentration camp, bribed the Ottoman bureaucrats. And they escaped back to Aleppo. And governor were furious. He sent a telegram, one telegram after another, saying that I'm stopping the deportation. There is no logic, there is, it doesn't make any sense, because all Armenians that I'm sending to Meskene, they are coming back. You better take care of it. Ottoman government indeed took care of it, and our general staff also published all these materials. They thought, you know, this is against corruption and so on, we are doing something good. Indeed, Ottoman government sent an investigation committee. This investigation committee made a lot of interrogations, took testimonies and so on. They published all these, and these events were exactly as Andonian were telling in his memoir, and one of them was the testimony of Naim Efendi. And it was saying that Naim Efendi was a dispatch officer working in Aleppo and in Meskene and so on. And he was also in his testimony confirming whatever uh, Andonian was telling us. So there are, I discovered other, dog, this is his signature, and I discovered other uh, sources also, the Ottoman materials that Naim Efendi exists. We solved one problem. And the second problem, so the memoir. I told you a story. I found this memoir in this private archive. I learned the story later because of the archival materials. They are all available on online now. I put everything on online. The story is following. This guy, Armenian priest, devoted his entire life to collect material on Armenian genocide. And he went to Paris 1951-52, before Andonion's death, we know from the archival materials, and he filmed everything. He filmed the memoir, he filmed the telegrams, originals. We should really erect a monument for that man. And this is how I discovered in that private archive this memoir. There is a small problem. Some of the pages here that I found was not published by Andonion. It's easy to explain. He thought they are not important. He excluded them. He didn't publish them. But there are some pages that Andonion published in the book 1921. I don't have it in this memoir. Why? We learned the story also from a private letter. Again, I found in the archive, 1938, Andonion wrote to a survivor in Geneva saying that, you know, some pages I sent to Istanbul because of a court case. They asked me to send some materials and incriminating materials, and there were some pages of Andonion's memoir. I sent them to Istanbul. So the missing pages is somewhere in, Istanbul, in Ankara or Istanbul in the basement. So, but here is the, another problem. We found the man, we found the memoir, but we should ask as a historian, because we know Naim was someone, he enjoyed gambling and was accustomed to taking bribes, and he was an alcoholic. So, simple question is, Naim Efendi knew that the Armenians were in search of documentation of massacre. Couldn't he have created and made up the events in his memoir and the documents also in order to make some money? Makes sense. So this is where the historian's job starts. I worked almost one year in Ottoman archive in Istanbul and Ankara and discovered amazing things. Just a couple examples and we can come to the question and answer period. This is from memoir. I told you, in between telegrams, he was saying something what he could remember. He was telling, oh, I remember, he writes. Exactly, I remember. Interior minister sent us a telegram. 
And he told us the Armenians from Maraş, from a province, Dişçekenyan, Hazarabedyan, Amiralyan, Toros Çağlasyan. They should not be deported. He said that we have the information, they are in Aleppo, don't send them to Derzor to be killed. Keep them in Aleppo. Because they were wealthy Armenians and relative of some deputies and so on and so forth. And um, uh, Naim Efendi says, our vicious governor, he didn't follow the order, he sent this individual to death. And you know, I discovered in Ottoman archive the document, the order of interior minister. Naim didn't publish anything about these names. And this is an Ottoman archival material. Today you can find in Ottoman archive and you have the same name, Dishchekenyan, Amiralyan, Hazarabedyan, Chalasyan. Exactly it was saying keep them in Aleppo. Here is the interesting story for you. These pages was not published by Andonion in his book in 1921. He thought, <laughs> It's not important. Why should I publish these in 1921? Maybe this was the reason that Ottoman Turkish authorities or Turkish government never thought they should destroy this material from the archive. This is one example. And in archive, I also found another document that Naim was talking and giving names without showing any original documents. And I found all in Ottoman archive also. And there are, I developed a list around 10 events. One of them, for example, taking orphaned Armenian children out of Aleppo and moving them to Sivas and Istanbul to other provinces. And Naim says that I was in charge actually to bring these uh, Armenian orphans from Aleppo all the way to Istanbul, but there was a money problem and so on and so forth. You know what happened? I work in the archive. I reconstruct the entire story as Naim was talking in his memoir. And I did it with 10 different points. This is the actually topic of the book. And I showed that this guy was telling us the truth. So let's give the last example about the falsity of telegrams. As you see here, this is a lined paper. This is one of the original documents that Andonion published in his book, 1921. 1983, Turkish Historical Society, Turkish government, in his book claimed one of the documents has been written on a double-lined paper which lacks any kind of official insignia. It resembles the kind of paper used in calligraphic classes in French schools, and it would be inconceivable that this kind of paper would have been the source for official communication Ottoman offices. Therefore, the document is fake. We all accepted the argument, because we couldn't prove otherwise. But now in Ottoman archive, there are so many materials. You know what the truth is? Truth is just the opposite. I found at least 10 orders going from Istanbul to provinces saying that, damn, don't write your coding numbers on without lined papers. The, the lines are mixing, and we couldn't decode them. It creates a lot of problems. Send, write them on the lined papers, damn. This is what you have to do. Here is the one example. It says, since there have been instances error being made, in order to prevent these sort of errors, necessary communication on this considers to be noticed to have the codes placed on lined paper. So this was just the opposite. This was showing the authenticity of the materials. So we saw one problem with them. This was one of their central arguments. About the cipher method, let me finish this and we can go. Uh, I don't want to go into detail. What was the argument? So these are the telegrams today available in Ottoman archive in Istanbul. As you see, this is four digit number. This is five digit number. This is what the uh, Turkish Historical Society claims. And what was the claim? There is no two and three digit coding system. Ottoman government never used them. Really? Ottoman archives are full two-digit and three-digit numbers, documents. 
And here is the interesting story. You will ask that why they put these documents. Because they started putting these kind of materials after 2012. I think Naim Andonian problem for them was already gone. It's done business. They never thought about it. They never looked these materials. And this is the human mistake, what we call mistakenly, and we are thankful to them, they put all these two digit, three digit numbers there. So let me finish with one example. I mean, I love this uh, example very much. Let me use this uh, also. Turkish Historical Society, in their book, they claimed Ottoman government used either four digit or five digit number. Okay? And they said if they used four digit, they don't use anything else, and only for a certain period of time. And they claimed 1916, March, April, Ottoman government used only four digit number group. And we couldn't have get access to Ottoman archive, and there was no document with coding system, we said that, hood up. I mean, it's great. We should accept that these documents were fake. And all documents, they said, this was the claim, for 1916, April, March, which are other than four digit, they are all fake. You know, I really count every telegram in the archive. There are all together 216 coded telegrams for the March, for the March month, and five digit 179. So they are all fake, according to their argument, because only four tele, only they could find uh, the number between 2016-17. Yeah, only 20 documents were in four digit. This is their claim. The rest were two digit or five digit. So their argument was also totally wrong with the coding system. So this is my last issue to Turkish authorities. <coughs> Did they really believe that the naive material are fake? Still, it's very easy to solve this problem. Publish the coding books. This is a coding book from 1914 for the three digit number system. And this makes sense. They create in Istanbul, this, there is a cipher office, special interior ministry. Their job was to create coding system. And after they created, they sent these books to the provinces. And when a three digit telegram comes from Istanbul, you open the coding book and you look into it and you decode the telegram. This is how the system works. And so, for 1915, we need two-digit, three-digit, four-digit, five-digit, four coding system. For 1916, coding system, same 17, 18, 19. Approximately 17, 16, 17 coding books. Where are they? They are not there. In Ottoman archive, there is no coding book available for scholars. Only 1914 three digit numbers. So here is the argument is very simple. If Naim documents had been fake, they would have been published these coding books length. They kept these coding books secret because they know that these are authentic. If they don't believe, then they should publish the coding system and solve the problem. I think with this all, the major denialist argument that we cannot show Ottoman government had intention to destroy the Armenians' gun. They have to find another narrative for their denialism. They will continue to deny. Because denialism has nothing to do with academic works, with truth, or with showing this. Denialism is the politique. It is a policy. There is no difference between Holocaust denialism and denialism of Armenian genocide, but the power. United States, 
Great Britain and State of Israel, they all backing Turkish government's denialist policy. And as long as they continue to back up Turkish government because of this or other reason, we should continue to fight for the truth. So the fight for the truth is not only the academic work, it is a part of a political fight. So the, we academicians, we can really help with some materials, but the last fight or decision will be made on the political level. So thank you very much for listening. questions. If you have a question, please do raise your hand. Do wait for a microphone to come so that everyone can hear the question, please. Thank you very much for that uh, fantastic lecture. My name is Jim Hunt. I'm in the History Department. I have two questions, really. One is about your work in the Turkish archives. Why do they let you work in the Turkish archives? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's a self-explanatory question. The second is about your own intellectual development. How did you, as a Turkish person, become interested in pursuing this very controversial topic that is, um, you know, that is that, that, that sort of diminishes the prestige of Turkey itself? Or just the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for the questions. The Islamist government has changed the entire structure of Ottoman archive after they came to power. They removed the old guard and they put real historians there. At the beginning, as you remember, uh, the Islamist government were reformist. They had a claim to open Turkey towards the European Union. And this was the period that I started working in the Ottoman archive. They welcomed me and they knew who I am and on which topic I was working. And we had a always nice conversation with each other and to, it still continues. Ottoman archive today, I have to repeat, one of the best archives in the world. If you worked in American or British or German archives, mainly in the foreign office materials, if you ask any documents or any topic, they will bring you files with 800, 900 pages, and you have to really go through. It's, it's hard work. I know I worked in all these archives. In Ottoman archive, they catalog the materials on individual document basis. You read the document summary in Turkish language, and they are mostly for the period that I'm working, digitized and available on the, their computers. And even today, they are trying to develop. You can even have an access from here and pay for this material and get this material. This is their claim. Of course, they don't put everything. Every national archive keeps something secret. Americans maybe 5%, British maybe 7%, but the Turks 50%. So this is, but at the end, the available materials are enough to show the genocidal intent of the Ottoman authorities. And I think uh, at the beginning, it was a problem maybe. I know a lot of scholars early 2000 or 1980s, 1990s, they were interrogated, they were taking special rooms, they were not giving the documents and so on. And every day you could get only 20 documents, not more. Today, you can download as much documents as you want. And if there is no digitized version of any document, they digitize it and make it available within 24 hours. It's an excellent system, and it's really great pleasure to work in these archives. So I urge, really, any scholar, historian who want to work on Middle East to use these archives extensively. Why they allow me? I think they cannot ban at this very moment. I'm, 
I, we don't like to talk about ourselves in the Middle East much, but I'm a very respected scholar now. And they don't want to risk to close these archives to me. I'm not going because of the political reason now in Turkey. This is another topic. But the archive is open. It's a walking archive. You don't, in all, all days, you had to ask the embassy here, get special permission. There is no need. Like the British Archive, if you go to the British Archive, they take a picture of you and they give you an ID and you start working. This is exactly the same system in Istanbul and Ankara. You can work the same way. Why I chose the topic, Armenian genocide? I have two answers. One is my father, the other is coincidence. My father is an indirect way. He was a teacher and grown up in a village in today's Russian border, Caucasus. And he was a kid of a very poor family. And he taught us, he really fought for his own life. Can you imagine in order to get education, to go to school, he walked, when he was nine years old, two days and two nights all alone because he heard that there is a border school for the kids, for the peasants' kids. And he went there, he became teacher, and he fought, and he graduated from the university. He became one of the important intellectuals in Turkey. And he taught me and my other uh, brother and sisters one thing. Just stand up. Never be silenced. If you want to be justice be done, you have to talk against injustices. This is how I grow up. This is one part that I took from my father. This is very important for me. I came to Hamburg. Uh, I didn't know that there are Armenians living in Turkey even. I mean, over these decades, the education, Turkish education, it was indoctrinated in a way that we never thought that there are Armenians living. In, I, was, I didn't know that. And Armenian genocide, our overall knowledge was, yeah, something bad happened, but it's a past history. Turks killed Armenian, Armenian kills Turk. It's better to cover up these issues. So it was for me also a psychological process to overcome my own difficulties. But I think the desire to learn the truth and to fight for justice was so dear to me. This is where I ended up really uh, choosing that topic. And uh, this is where I am now. After reading your book, I was very impressed with how much data you accumulated and how much cross-referencing you did. I'm curious what some of your methods were to store and cross-reference and, and use it. And secondly, I'm sure you're not a favorite of Mr. Erdogan. Are you worried for your personal safety? Um, the cross-reference, it is a very important point. We work, I mean, the critical scholar in Turkey, we work with zero tolerance. We are not allowed to make any single mistake. If we make really one mistake, then they will kill us. They will throw it out of window. But denialists, they try, they lie every day. This is they allowed. So this is the reason I try to show that any argument that I have is based on several different sources. This is, I'm very careful in that. This is the method that I used. I know I work with zero tolerance. This is the, uh, it's an important rule that I have been following. Regarding Erdogan, until 2016, I was going every summer to Turkey. Uh, now, after 2016, you remember 2016 summer, there was an, a coup attempt with, which failed. And after that, Turkey became one of the dictatorial regimes in the world, like the Russia or other places. And it is not safe 
for me legally to travel to Turkey. This is, I'm not going now until again with a, uh, we call it winter back and we hope that spring will come sometime that we can go back to Turkey again. Thank you for your talk, it was really enlightening. I have a question that I ask every Turkish friend or relative. How come the Turks and the Ottomans have separated in everywhere? Ataturk basically wanted to efface the Ottoman Empire. Why is it that when it comes to the Armenian genocide, they continue with the history of the Ottomans? What is it that makes the Armenian genocide something that they want to deny? when they could have just completely said it's the Ottomans and not modern Turkey? Yeah, the answer is actually very simple. My dear mentor, Vahakın Dadrian, uh, used to answer to this kind of question. Imagine 1945, the Nazis won the war. And somebody would come and ask, Holocaust, then Nazis would say, Holocaust? What Holocaust? They would deny. Why? because Nazis would co continue to cover up their own crimes. This is the basic for Turkish denialism. Turkish Republic, as it is today, as it stays today, was established by the party that organized the Armenian Genocide. We have a continuity of the party, CUP. It is the same party today in Turkey, we call it uh, Turkish, the People's uh, Party, this is the CHP, and the, the individuals who organized the Armenian Genocide, they became important officers during the Republic period. So there is a continuity in the ruling elite that comes all the way today. This is the main reason that they deny. There is a second important reason, it is money. Makes sense, material reason. If Turkey acknowledges any wrongdoing, they should compensate this. And they don't want to do that. This is the second important reason. If you want, I can tell you the third one, Pinocchio. What is Pinocchio's role? You know, the more he lies, the more the nose long. So Turkey's nose is very long. It's, 100 years, you know, it's very difficult in your personal relations also. If you lie once, you can take it back, maybe. But if you lie 10, 20, 30 times, it becomes the reality. I think Turkey created its own reality. We have a very long nose. This is the third important factor. Hi, thank you so much. This may be a little unfair because I know that you try to work very carefully from the documents and the documents don't usually uh, sort of muse about their motives. They just sort of you know, say do this or do that. But have you been able uh, through your study of the archive and just from your uh, knowledge of this in general, there's a lot of debate about why the motivations uh, behind the massacres and the genocide. Have you been able to discern, uh, you know, is it, mainly nationalism, mainly you know, the fight over territory, all the different explanations. Which do you find most compelling from your study of this? It's a great question, actually. Uh, and there is no one single reason. In all cases, we know genocide is a very complicated social event, and it's a combination of different factors and reasons. Oh, if you ask me, I would give the answer in the following way. Number one, the religious difference. Muslim versus Christian were very important, but this was only, it provided the cultural background. It was like the anti-Semitism in Europe. Anti-Semitism is an important background, a cultural atmosphere within which genocide can occur, but it cannot explain the genocide per se. Because as all you know, the Holocaust students in France, anti-Semitism were stronger than in Germany. But the genocide, uh, mass atrocities happened in uh, Germany, basically. So the Muslim-Christian conflict 
was the cultural background within which the uh, massacres or the genocide was organized. The main reason for the ruling elite was the political. This is what we call in our day, in the daily politics, security politic. Ottoman government thought that they would lose the entire historic Armenia to Armenians as an independent state. You, if you know the Middle East or Ottoman history a little bit, you know that it was the third biggest empire in the world history, covered the North Africa, all the way to Wien, the Europe, Caucasus, even the Black Sea, and the uh, Arabic Peninsula, they were all provinces, and Egypt, these were all provinces of Ottoman Empire. And they lost one territory after another during 19th century. And the main reason why they lost the territories was the independence movement of Christian people within Ottoman Empire. They asked the Christian mainly asked social reforms and equality. They were denied by Ottoman government. And this created another uproar by the Christian minorities, where then the great powers intervened. At the end, Ottoman government lost one territory after another. This is the same pattern that they lost today's Yugoslavia, Bosnia, Serbia, uh, uh, Montenegro, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, after one another with the same model. And 19, and the Balkan War, they lost in Balkan War an important part of their territory. 1914 February, you should keep this mind always, 1914 February, Ottoman government signed a reform agreement with Russians, according to which eastern provinces, historic Armenia, should be semi-autonomous provinces within Ottoman government. Ottomans wanted never implement this plan because this is how Serbs started. This is how Bulgarians, how Greeks, how Montenegrins, this is how they lost their territory. This is the reason that they never wanted to implement the plan. And when they entered the World War I on the side of Germans, they thought they, can, they could get rid of this agreement. This is the first thing that they did, actually, when they entered officially into the war 1914 November. First thing they did, they declared null and void this reform agreement. But it was not enough. 1915, early months, Russian army won an important war on Sarıkamış, on Caucasus, and invading historic Armenia. For everybody, it was clear, we thought, the Russians, the Muslims would run away, and the Armenians would be in the area, and Russia would implement the reform plan, and you have the Armenia. And instead of allowing Russians to occupy the territory and allow implementing the reform plan, they removed the entire Armenian population and exterminated. Today's Turkey based on this genocidal policy. It's very obvious. So for me, security, this is what they call it, the territorial integrity of Ottoman Empire was their major motivation to exterminate Armenian population. They didn't care much on economy. We know from their records. Uh, Morgenthau, the American ambassador, told interior minister saying that, you know, if you remove the Armenians, they were the artisans, they were the really uh, middle class in different cities, it will, be a, it will bring an economic disaster. They said, we don't care. We have to search create territorial integrity. I think this is the major reason. I don't have a question. Um, I just want to say, 
as an Armenian who grew up in this country, I'm here with my father who grew up, he's actually, um, his family's from Urfa, which you mentioned. Um, I have to say that it's a true honor and privilege to be in your presence. I have lived with my parents and have heard and have experienced the Armenian genocide through their stories. My father's mother, all of their, my grandparents were survivors of the genocide. And for 48 years, that burden, that violation has been living with me, with my parents, and with my children. So you give me hope. You are, in fact, the savior for Armenians, and I know that you don't, you are modest, but you need to know that everything that you do makes a difference in our lives as Armenians, and we are eternally grateful to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Would you comment on the role of Germany in the Armenian Genocide? We know that uh, uh, Ambassador Morgenthau thought that they had some responsibility. And uh, I think your colleague, uh, Von Dadrian, wrote a book entitled German Responsibility. To what degree do you think that they have any responsibility in that genocide? It's a wonderful question. It's a great topic for comparative genocide studies. Jody, you have to teach in your, including your France in Rwandan genocide, Germans in Armenian genocide. It's a wonderful comparative case. We know today Morgenthau was lying. The Americans, 1916, 17, 18, they exaggerated the German role because they wanted America enters the war against Germany. They needed some arguments against Germany, and they could not only argue that we won't go into war because of colonial interest. You have to say that, like Bush, we are going to Iraq bring to democracy. So uh, Ottoman Turks were exterminating Armenians, and it was a good reason for America to go into the war, but not then how against Germany or because Germans organized this. So the Germans were the idea giver. They gave the idea, was the Morgenthau's main argument. Today's scholarly uh, state of the art on that topic, we know almost every German documents. Uh, with one word, German closed their eyes. And this entire genocide made in Turkey. This is a Turkish product. Even Turks deceived the Germans. I don't want to go into detail, but Germany helped Turks to deny the Armenian genocide. Uh, one example, 1916, a young uh, ambassador comes to Istanbul, Metternich, he saw, he got all these reports, killing of Armenians and so on, and he sent one report after another to Batman Holweg, to the uh, counselor in Berlin, saying that we have to do something, we have to do something, the Turks, they killed here Armenians, they are our Christian brothers, and so on. Then he finally uh, wrote a statement and he said that we have to publish this statement in all German newspapers. Batman Holweg wrote on the side of this energic ambassador's report saying that it is unheard of that a state published against something against their allies. And we need Turkey on our side during the war whether Armenians were killed, it's not our problem. This was the German attitude throughout the period, and all these denialist arguments was organized in Berlin, written, and Germans helped to deny the Armenian genocide. But really believe, I mean, this is what we believe, this is made by Turks. Maybe one last sentence, it's also important. Uh, because of the comparative uh, studies. Germany occupied Belgium 1914, July, August. You may heard German atrocities. 
and it became a huge problem in the war. And there were the Germans deported the Belgians as terrorists, and they put them in concentration camps. Two important individuals. One is the governor of the Belgium, and the second, the commander of the military, German military forces. Schellendorf, Bronsart von Schellendorf, and von der Goltz Pasha. They were appointed later to Turkey, Ottoman Empire. When they started their work, they indeed suggested Ottoman government to do the exact way that the Germans did in Belgium, namely to remove the find the population elements from the war zone. This is what became later Turkish denialist arguments. And Turks started, when they started exterminating Armenians, they told Germans that we are just doing what you told us. We are just removing the people from the war zone, nothing else. So this is the other important part. So the idea, the idea was given by Germans in the way of removing the population from war zone. And Turks said, let's trick these Germans. We deceive them. We exterminate Armenians. If you read the German materials, 1915 from May all the way mid-July, one and a half months, the German ambassador from Istanbul was writing, the Turks only doing what they promised us. All these massacres and killings, they are all lies. But when the news one after another came, then they understood that they were deceived, actually. So, so we have one uh, for time for one more question. So. so um my question is about like what form is resistance taking now in Turkey? Because obviously what you're doing is like a type of resistance to denial to the Armenian of the Armenian genocide. But are any like younger generations or is anything happening in Turkey to combat this denial that's like still happening? I don't have good news, especially after two thousand sixteen. Uh, you may have heard the name Hrant Dink, an Armenian journalist in Istanbul, a close friend of mine, who was assassinated 2007 January. It really broke the wall in Turkey, the silence. And uh, there was a growing civil society in Turkey and publications. And uh, even in Istanbul, every year, commemoration of Armenian genocide, that it was really a part of Turkey's democratization. And it was also the period where Kurds were, became more loud, and they were asking for their own democratic and social rights, and so on. These are all gone now. And we don't know whether this spring with a, again comes back. Uh, there isn't not much going on in Turkey. The prisons are full with Turkish intellectuals, with critical thinking people, and we really don't know where this process will end. I don't have good news in that regard, but our only hope is that spring will come sometimes. They cannot keep this closed so long. This is the only answer that I have. Okay, thank you very much. So before, oh, go ahead.